stuff in Morales Lab, right? Yeah. I think we broke that here. Yes. Very. Oh, the memory box. And like helping them with this. So it's not my memory. Geospatial Forum. I'm Rob Smithmeyer, the director of the center, and it's a super huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Georgina Sanchez as our uh, speaker today. Not a guest, <laughs> but our, our speaker. Uh, Georgina is a research scholar and faculty fellow in our center, and her interdisciplinary research uses geospatial analytics to address some of the biggest complicated, complex sustainability challenges we know of, often very timely, like uh, uh, blood risk and climate adaptation associated with uh, land, human land use. Uh, Regina's research also really uniquely involves participatory modeling techniques and principles of knowledge co-production to engage communities, stakeholders, and end users in the development of strategies to tackle these, these challenges and really work with them using the geospatial approaches in the places they live, they work, they recreate, all those types of things. And that's <laughs> um, she's won multiple federal awards to support her exciting research agenda, and she actively mentors graduate students in the center in her work. If you've had the opportunity to work with Georgina, you know why she's a rising leader, of the Center for Geospatial Analytics and the whole university. Excited to hear your talk today. Thank you, Ross. Um, I'm really happy to be here just because it's slightly different with friends and colleagues. I very much appreciate that. Yeah, let me put up um, not wireless mouse. Okay. Um, Today, I'll focus on scenario-based modeling and how we can use it to then explore alternative pathways to become a bit more resilient. And then through research engagement, how we can then bring those insights from, scenario, from scenarios to, to find that connection to on-the-ground decisions for planning purposes so that we can do a, a guide where, where and how we can develop and we can continue to adapt to a changing environment. Before I go ahead and start, I would like to acknowledge the amazing group of people that I have had the privilege to work with. And if you've ever worked with me, you know that I love floating big faces. <laughs> and um, every one of them has contributed to at least one of the projects that I'll touch base on today. And every one of them has contributed to my geospatial journey in one way or another. And for that, I am deeply grateful. John asked me to address these three questions for you throughout the course of my presentation. So my hope for today is to tell you three stories. First, how has your career trajectory led you to using a geospatial perspective? I'm going to tell you what was the event in my life that triggered this desire to approach spatial problems. Back in 2010, I leave, learn, and conduct research at this small farming town in Costa Rica. At the time, the town was really struggling with an overuse of agrochemicals. Most of you know that I am originally from Costa Rica. So let's go ahead and picture this. We're talking about beautiful Costa Rica, Pura Vida Costa Rica, this place that is well known for its people's deep connection to nature and for organic farming. Yet we had this town overusing agrochemical products, everything from pesticides to fertilizers. So here we go, this is Costa Rica. I'm taking you to the province of Cartago. The town is Pacallas. This beautiful small town in the mountain area. You see how it is surrounded by fields. Here we have potatoes cabbage, carrots, cauliflower. I'm zooming in. Perhaps a little bit more difficult to grasp from this perspective is the steepness of the terrain. Some of these fields are on a 70% slope, which means that in a great deal, farmers here rely on manual labor or animal power, something that maybe we don't see as much in the US. And that is me actually in the picture guiding a junta de bueyes or a pair of oxen. 
And when I say guiding, that's probably giving myself a bit too much credit. <laughs> it, it, I was destroying those potatoes. And, but we technically use this to flip the soil in between rows of potatoes. And, but up to this point, researchers have used mapping and monitoring to pinpoint this community as a hotspot of agrochemical overuse. So a lot of agencies came together and a team was placed so that we can address a little bit of like, you know, what's going on here? Let's try to identify a couple of potential solutions. So it was a huge concern and a big question mark. Why we have this small community in the mountains of Costa Rica with such an overuse of agrochemical products when it was not really needed? So here we had universities, health department, the Ministry of Agriculture running education campaigns on the harmful effects of overuse of agrochemical products. And farmers, they were regularly attending these training sessions. They also had access to uh, soil testing, they had access to technical support, yet despite all of this, the problem persisted. So it became pretty evident that we had to do something different. So this is when engaging with the community became a must. And this is when a group of students, we were given the wonderful opportunity to go and live and work with families of farmers. And so we did. For about two months, 12 or 15 of us, if my mom memory doesn't fail me, we went and lived each with a different family. <clears throat> and this, uh, to be honest, this experience completely changed my life. This is one of those moments where everything, everything I thought I knew was challenge. There was no one engineering book that would give you good insight of what was going on here. And at the time, I was finishing my undergrad in agricultural in engineering at the University of Costa Rica. And so really putting you know, to the test all of that technical knowledge that, we, that you learn, and, with, and it all embedded within a real problem with a real community that was also affecting, of course, the environment. But what I think I extracted the most out of this experience was the notion of framing a spatial problem. This idea of taking data to pinpoint the where and what of impact and through engagement, understand who's affected and how. I'm gonna pause my story here, but I promise you get to hear about what happened towards the end of my presentation. So stay with me. On to my second story. What role do geospatial approaches play in what you do? A geospatial framework is central in understanding and exploring the where and when of impact so that we can understand who's affected and how. In a nutshell, this is what I aim to accomplish through my research. Let's take, for example, the different climate stressors that impact different regions of the nation. Right now, extreme precipitation hits hard and hits home after all the devastation across Western North Carolina following Hurricane Helene. But whether from extreme precipitation, hurricanes, or sea level rise, frequent flooding is a major concern all across our region, and we are highly susceptible. So this is why I have dedicated most of my research to understand flood risk and how flood management policies influence the where and how we build our urban spaces so that we can extract that information, introduce into models that help us explore alternative solutions. It is more and more common to be confronted with news articles like this, where people are caught, communities are caught off guard as they're experiencing damage in areas they were not expecting it, like outside of designated flood zones. Designated flood zones are areas that government agencies like FEMA in the United States classify as having a high risk of flooding. In the US, we consider high risk of flooding any region that has a 1% or greater chance of flooding in any given year. These areas are also referred to as the regulatory 100 year flood plain, and that's exactly what I'm displaying. Right now, you see locations in gray. Those represent every single location throughout the 40 
through the lower 48 states that has an available FEMA floodplain map. The actual 100-year floodplain is in black, so you see those spectacles. And white areas represent data gaps. This is where we don't have yet the models in place uh, to map areas that we consider of high risk for flooding. A lot of things go into generating the models and maps ultimately that um, provide this regulatory information, historical flood data, topography, drainage systems, land cover. Notably, climate change is not accounted for when we process these really important information. But overall, it's an expensive and time-consuming process. There's an estimate that plays it anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars per linear mile of, of stream to generate this type of map. So when we multiply that throughout the extensive network of streams that we have throughout the nation, then of course it adds up. It is quite expensive, and it's why it, it, this explains a little bit of those data gaps. Um, but not just the fact that it's expensive to generate it once but the fact that we need to continue updating this information as uh, the landscape change. And well, technically we should also include changes in the climate, but at least to represent current risk, it would be useful also to update this match regularly. Yeah, so going back to these data gaps, we have about 91% of the population in the lower 48, they do have access to uh, this important regulatory information covering about 60% of this territory, which means that 9% of this population, really large chunk of our population, don't really have access to this type of information. That covers roughly 40% of the extension that I'm displaying here mostly characterized by areas that are less populated and uh, with small streams. And this information is critical. This information is something that we use for planning. It guides flood insurance requirements, flooding, uh, building requirements, even eligibility for buyout uh, programs. So it's really important for communities to have this resource, uh, yet many of them don't have it. But it's also really important information that dictates where and how we develop. And this is why we took on the task to try to understand a bit better how this really important regulatory information is impacting where our built environment is located. So we evaluated the impact of the 100-year floodplain on development patterns by assessing the spatial distribution across 250-meter distance zones. Just to give you a sense of scale, 250 meters is roughly the size of two average city blocks. Okay, let's put things into context. Here, here we have Asheville, North Carolina. In the center of the image, you can see the original airport. If I were to overlay FEMA's 100-year floodplain, this is what we see. It's, you know, pretty, pretty simple. You're either inside or outside of that area. Now, if we generate 250-meter concentric distance zones from the edge of the floodplain, we obtain something like this. Um, you can see it very clear where I'm zooming there. Can you see it very clear? Yes, you can. Um, and then we have areas beyond 2,000 meters or two kilometers, uh, all classified in a single zone. Those are the lighter tone of blue. Uh, the idea behind this was for us to really be able to concentrate on how this regulatory information is impacting nearby patterns more so than just everywhere. So that's why we ended up aggregating anything that is beyond two kilometers as a single bus. Now we bring in the information about the built environment. Here we have data from the National Land Cover Database, a um, classified land as developed. So you can now see how it's pretty intuitive to quantify the amount of developed land inside the floodplain and across each one of these distance zones or in areas that are beyond the two kilometer mark. And we did this for all over the lower 48 states, every location that had an available FEMA map. All of you will see me saying FEMA map, flood risk, flood map, 100 year floodplain, I'm referring to the same type of information. And we obtained a very clear result. Uh, <clears throat> about 24% of developed land nationwide is disproportionately concentrated right at the edge 
of the floodplain. This map is telling you which zone within all the evaluated zones has the highest percentage of developed land. One caveat here was really important for us to normalize by area, because as you can imagine, if you simply has, have greater area within a given county from one of those zones, so sure, then if you have more development within, within that area. So in order to, to uh, consider that, you see here that values are as a proportion of the total land area in each given zone. Yeah, but we observe a couple of different things here. So about 10% of the counties, uh, all with available female maps, the most developed land is inside the floodplain. Ooh, I see some faces. It's pretty striking, I agree with you. Um, now we, hear, we see here this cluster of counties, this dark blue, I keep on looking at that monitor where I think that the colors are much better than here. Let me see what you're looking at. So we see this cluster of counties where all development is concentrated inside of the floodplain. A couple of things explain this very clear pattern, uh, one of which is topography. Um, when you have steep lands, then that suitable land for development tend to be in flatter areas and those tend to be near streams. Therefore, inside of the floodplain, most, most likely than not. Another very striking number here. In 27% of these counties, the highest concentration of development is right at the edge of the floodplain. Why is this so concerning? because we are locating all our built environment, most of our built environment, and therefore most likely our, our population if we use it as a proxy, in right immediately outside of this zone, right? We're simplifying risk by saying you're either inside or outside. And the problem is that I just mentioned that in many cases, these maps are outdated. They don't account for changes in the landscape. They don't account for changes in our climate. So that line is much fuzzier. We are actually concentrating a lot of our built environment population in an area that is at risk for flooding. Last, I'll just continue hitting the same point for one more time. For half of these counties, the highest concentration of development is within the first 500 meters. So roughly four city blocks. That's nothing. That's a really wide, uh, that's a really narrow strip of land. And yes, some of you are probably thinking, well, Georgina, but horizontal proximity doesn't equate actual risk. And I agree, you're completely right. Yeah, we can have a property that is immediately outside of the floodplain, but in an elevated terrain, and that would make them to be outside of that potential exposure, absolutely. But the important thing here is that we're not really talking about actual risk. We're talking about communicated risk. How we say, in this area, in this zone, you are at risk. There are requirements that you need to obey. But immediately outside of this line, regardless if it's an inch or a mile away, no requirements apply. Your risk is minimal. We also looked at this trend across every single state. So I show you those nationwide uh, values. Now let's look at every single state. Uh, overall, we look at, we observe the same trend. We see this very clear pattern where development increases with proximity to the edge of the floodplain. And this was true for every single state within the lower 48. I am highlighting North Carolina just because it's relevant to us, but also because it provides a very, very clear uh, trend here, very, that, that very clear peak that you see at the 250 meter mark. But we can also look at very extreme ca cases like Florida and Texas. Again, these are absolute values, developed land in uh, square kilometers by 2019, but when we normalize by area, the same ex exact trend is true as well. Last, we looked at things at the county level. So here we have the full distribution of counties. Uh, you see that I'm still highlighting in red that 250 meter uh, distance zone immediately outside of the floodplain. Again, the greatest concentration of developments there. I'm showing a couple of bits, additional bits of information here. 
two historical observations, 2001 and 2019, but I'm also sharing one more bit of information, future projections. Many of you are familiar with the futures land change model and using it, we simulate urban growth through the year 2060 and um, without simulating any type of changes. The idea here was simply to extrapolate historical patterns or to continue rather, I should say, uh, historical patterns. And we observe that if we were to continue this trend, then effectively things will be the same. We'll continue placing the greatest amount of new growth in this same location immediately outside of the regulatory 100 year flood thing. There's one key insight that we draw from this manuscript. The binary classification of risk zones, this idea of inside versus outside, creates a false perception that properties just outside the floodplain are quote unquote safe. So we argue that the safe, that the US regulatory one of the US regulatory floodplain represents a very clear example of the safe development paradox. And the safe development paradox is um, this effect that it, it, in an effort to reduce flood risk, we are paradoxically increasing it by encouraging development at the edge of the flooding, despite that risks extend well beyond it. In a way, this is an unintended consequence of a widely adopted flood management strategy. So here is where the what if takes on a really important role. What if we could visualize and test not yet enacted flood policy strategies? Or what if we can evaluate alternative trends of growth to then evaluate trade-offs and compare possible outcomes? This is where the true power of scenario-based modeling lies, and our ability to envision adaptive, sustainable pathways to a more resilient future. So let me share with you one more example. Uh, here we have Charleston, South Carolina. It's a coastal area. <clears throat> we have that bird's eye view perspective. This is a low-lying area rapidly growing. Charleston is known for the effect of the coastal squeeze, this idea where natural important ecosystems are threatened by the compound pressure from sea level rise and urban expansion. Charleston is an area that I would argue stands at the forefront of climate adaptation, given how vulnerable it is to flooding. <clears throat> Current state-of-the-art and risk assessment and exposure involves something like this, something quite similar to what I just share with you with the 100-year flood plain. We overlay inundation information onto existing development to pinpoint at-risk locations. Yet I would argue this only provides a partial picture. Neighborhoods are not born equal and our models should account for disparity <coughs> and for different levels of adaptive capacity when assessing risk and estimating exposure. So in the new version of the futures land change model, I've mentioned earlier, I'll spend a little bit more time explaining it right here. And the future urban regional environment simulation model, we now allow users to simulate interactions between urban growth, increased flooding, and human adaptive response. So in addition to understanding land change processes that are driven by urbanizations, we can simulate three adaptive responses, and I'll touch base on each one of them in a minute. But here we have a business as usual trend of growth. So for the Charleston metro area, we're anticipating that population and economic growth are likely to continue to drive demand for new development in coming decades, leading to the conversion of natural lands into working lands. Futures provides a probabilistic framework. So here on the map, areas that are color or darker orange, those represent locations that are more likely to see this conversion to develop uses. In areas that are in lighter tones of orange, those are less likely to do so. Here we have the first adaptive response, protective measures. Um, the idea here is to capture that as residents and planners become increasingly aware of the growing threats of flooding, they are likely to adapt when feasible 
by elevating infrastructure or building protective measures like a levee or a seawall or nature-based nature -based solutions. Now, these areas, I'm classifying them um, in darker turquoise. Those are locations that are more likely to have or find the necessary resources to build protective measures or to rebuild after damage. <coughs> In order for us to consider where these patterns may occur, we integrate local metrics of vulnerability. We also integrate structural attributes of the building stock. The idea here is to use an approach similar to what the Army Corps of Engineers uses, where we use depth damage functions. So under different levels of flooding, we have an idea of what is the likely uh, damage. Here we have the second response, retreat. Yeah, of course, not all residents will have the necessary resources to build protective measures. So without specific policies in place to minimize exposure or potential damage, vulnerable populations may be forced or may choose to retreat as a form of adaptive response to these growing threat of flooding. And that's exactly what I'm showing here. These are concentrations of vulnerabilities in dark purple where communities may lack those, those protective resources and they could potentially become tomorrow's uh, climate migrants. Similarly, we also introduce these two metrics of local vulnerability and the, the attributes of the building and uh, stock. All so that we can understand and tweak parameters and allow users now to simulate different scenarios. Through scenarios, we can evaluate different thresholds of resistance to relocation. Let's say in this one scenario that I'm displaying in the back, uh, impacted areas retreat if they say if they face damage that exceeds 80% of the property value, total property value. But we can uh, modify, we can uh, in, um, change different parameters then to test different sensitivities to retreat. Again, based on uh, grounded scenarios. And here we have the last adaptive response, trapped. Due to the high cost of both adaptive responses, protective responses, and migration, trapped communities are those that are likely to retreat only if or when a flood event threatens their lives. Same on the map, the more likely locations to experience this response are represented on the darker tone of pink. I think this image very well represents or captures what I mean with a trapped community. Here we have a resident with flood water up to their knees holding a sign that says, please slow down, your waves are flooding our homes. Effectively, this is, these are people that live with the floods. Now, when we put all land changes, all the whole landscape of the, uh, of the change and response, now we have a more resolved understanding of what is going on across this region. Knowing where that impact happens and how communities might respond, that can help us create locally appropriate solutions or locally targeted solutions. For the Charleston metro area, we computed a number of different scenarios, five scenarios represented by different colors on the, uh, within this graph. I'm not gonna dive into each one of these scenarios. All I want is for you to see the, the true power of scenario model where we can then compare the, the trade-offs and outcomes for different scenarios. This graph is showing you percent change in developed land exposed to flooding. If you have values that are above zero, that represents greater exposure on the future scenario relative to current conditions. If you have values below zero, that means lower exposure relative to current conditions. <clears throat> from, this, uh, from this study, we identify that the managed retreat scenario was the one that allowed us to, the only one that would reduce exposure relative to current conditions. That is very intuitive, of course, if we remove people and the homes, businesses from flood prone areas, sure, we're going to by the fact reduce exposure and potential damage. 
Absolutely. Now, but when we think about managed retreat, we also need to think about the indirect effects. Are these destination communities prepared to receive a potential influx of climate migrants? For the Charleston Metro study, we saw that most retreating residents stay within nearby counties, but we also observed that some of them might move as far west as California, Washington State, and Oregon. Again, this is one more uh, advance that we allow through the futures model now, where we are able to capture these migration trends based on historical migration. And up to this point, I've shared with you what we have done for the Charleston metro area. But we have also estimated or computed scenarios across the region, from North Carolina through Texas, to understand then at a regional level some of these trends and patterns, to better understand what could be the impact at a greater scale for ecosystems and people. So we are anticipating through projections to continue to see an expansion of the urban uh, of the urban footprint within coastal cities and inland cities that are frequently impacted by hurricanes and storms, and of course, sea level rise. But now this, this larger view allows us to ask really interesting questions, like can we identify pathways to protect salt marsh migration? Now we're talking about a completely different thing. Now we're talking about understanding people migration and habitat migration and where they might overlap so that we can proactively protect areas that facilitate migration of really important ecosystems. We can ask other questions like, where could new development hotspots emerge as people make an effort to find safer locations to rebuild? Are we to expect a new hub, a new hotspot of development? At the core, of scenario-based modeling is stakeholder engagement. Through engagement, we can inform scenarios and adaptive strategies, which in turn can shape planning and on the ground decisions. So now we're talking about scientifically plausible scenarios that are grounded on local knowledge. Scenario-based, uh, rather, yeah, <laughs> stakeholder engagement can take on many different forms, and it should, so that we meet people where they are. It could emerge out of highly technical work, like the work from my PhD student, Margaret, where she combined machine learning, scenario-based modeling, and zoning to understand potential exposure and risk. Yeah, this work led her to directly collaborate with the town of Leland Planning Department. Uh, the Leland, for those of you that are not quite familiar, it's in the coast of North Carolina. It's in Brunswick County. Brunswick is the fastest growing county in the nation. So town representatives, the planning department were eager to work with her. And this work was supported by C Grant, NCC Grant, and we counted with the superpowers of Kayla Cothram in the back of the room. She was the person that made the connections and facilitated a lot of this engagement. And we continue to work together and with the planning department to find ways in which Margaret's research can be used for their long range planning. We can also find creative ways to engage with a large number of stakeholders. Earlier this year and in collaboration, with the Coastal Resilience and Sustainability Initiative, um, I helped develop a game. Who here has played Futurescape? Okay, like about four hands were up. Okay, okay, for those of you with your hands down, you are meeting up. <laughs> in Futurescape, stakeholders are placed in this real world policy setting where information with incomplete resources are limited and time is constrained. Effectively, through games, we can also engage with a number of different stakeholders in a completely different environment and elicit their values and preferences that later on we can introduce into models. So here, for instance, we place the stakeholders in an environment where they have to reach consensus and negotiate among themselves to make decisions about where to place those limited resources, 
how to protect a growing population that is facing social, economic, and environmental challenges. And earlier this year, we got to play it with a lot of people. Over 100 faculty, domain experts, and students participated in an event where we, they were placed up to the challenge. Here we have very, one very specific type of stakeholder. Let's call it the academic stakeholder. <laughs> and, and each one of them, you see different tables. Every table was playing their own game independent from each other. And at the end, we can also gather this data and analyze the findings. So let me show you a little bit of what we observed. And stakeholders <laughs> favor proactive actions over actions that accept or resist change. What do I mean by proactive actions? This direct type of actions. Uh, here's an example. Building a living shoreline over an accept or resist type of action. Resi an accept type of action would be incentivizing, uh, incentivizing buyout programs. And a resist type of action would be building a seawall or building a levee. Okay, so we see this greatest, the greatest preference towards direct, directive type of actions. Again, information that we can use to later on fine tune parameters and scenarios. We can also extract information throughout space of how people indicate their preference for population dynamics. So again, from the from the ten different games that were played uh, across, you know, hundred stakeholders from those different backgrounds that are academic stakeholder, we observed that both coastal retreat and expansion was true, but also that most population growth was directed inland, upward, and outward. So here, areas that are in darker purple, those represent a, uh, among all games played location hotspots for higher density development. And those lighter tones of uh, purple, those represent lower density development, but still, that uh, population growth was directed over there. And green is the opposite, it's population loss. So you see most of it concentrated across the coastline. I'm here assuming that you were all at this point familiar with the landscape to realize that this simplified version is the coastal plain of North Carolina. But I was supposed to say that earlier. <laughs> um, I'm not a game developer, by all means, uh, and nor that is part of my area of expertise, but through collaboration and just because this ended up being a special problem, it felt kind of familiar to approach the challenge. To my last story, this will be a short story. What is the future of geospatial analytics in your field? I believe that geospatial analytics is and will remain a catalyst for innovative interdisciplinary efforts. When we use data to understand where and when impact happens and through engagement, dive into who's affected and how, that is a broad enough scope that is relevant to so many different disciplines. So I think that through geospatial analytics, we basically become that glue, that connector between multiple different disciplines to address interesting, challenging questions. I believe that scenario modeling will continue to leverage stakeholder engagement every time through new technology so that we can elevate spatial knowledge and then together find sustainable and just solutions. Um, citizen science is a really good example of this. Uh, or the research that we saw from Ariel yesterday, I thought it was a fantastic example as well, using social media. Well, of course, her application was to identify pests, but when we think about different ways to engage a large audience, to engage mass masses of people, to extract their values and preferences, that's another really novel and really great application. Other applications that I that I think are really important here is web development, web applications that would allow us to engage with effectively an unlimited almost number of people to gather their insights, their, no, their, their local expertise about different locations and how they're struggling with different situations. Okay, as promised, back to Pacayas, Costa Rica. Here we are in the mountains of Costa Rica. Uh, why was this small town overusing 
agrochemical products? The answer is, well, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> a, number, a number of factors played a role. Uh, in farmers with with far, with their fields and the steeper slopes, of course, they they felt that they had to overcompensate and overapply uh, fertilizers for that to compensate for the loss of soil. But through my personal experience, through my engagement and my connection with with my host family and the farmer that I worked with, we were able able to uncover one really important factor. The sales team of the agrochemical supplier that worked around this town, they worked on commission. The more they sold, the more they earned. Would we have been able to understand this from some map or spatial analysis? Hard to tell. But since this spatial issue was approached through community-engaged research, we gained this deeper level, deeper understanding about the challenge and the potential solutions. Just a reminder that this was about 15 years ago, so I'm very happy to report that practices have significantly changed since then. Thank you very much. Is that a wide angle lens photo or is that the real? That was a real photo. And do you know what's the most surprising aspect of that? This was 15 years ago. So that was when we used to carry um, the, the camera. <laughs> camera. <laughs> <laughs> to the younger and they used to have cameras. cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that was an actual picture. <laughs> Thanks, Georgina. That was that was really interesting. I missed just the very beginning, but um, I really like your work and the way you think. I'm curious about the middle part, the plus one paper. Um, could you tell me exactly how you define developed land, like what all was included there? And then I'm also curious, like how you're communicating, how you're communicating this. Like, how do you tell a city manager, much less a developer, this information? How can like how do you work with communities to consider how they're developing at that 25 to 500 meter space? Because there's there's a lot of pressures. Yes, yeah. great questions. What do we define as develop and how we communicate these findings? Develop, well, that's that's an easy answer. We rely on how others has, have yeah. defined develop. So we use data from the National Land Cover Database. They have specific thresholds. If uh, about 20% of the land area is classified as impervious, then then we'll say this is developed. So we are considering what they classify as open space, me low, medium, and high development. Yeah, that is a way to consider it. So that means, in other words, that we integrate everything from a road to a rooftop to a low density residential type of environment, but yes, areas that are mostly characterized because there's a presence of impervious surface. To your second question, I sort of tested this recently. Um, in, an, in a different project we had, now I realize that I can move around. <laughs> Forward, I was a little bit trapped over there. Um, we tested this with Jones County that I know you're familiar with. Uh, working with their planning department, with the county, the number of different county leaders, we and the students were doing very similar mapping exercises, well, simple mapping exercises. And one of them was, okay, I want you to count every single property using Microsoft database, that, you know, the building footprint. Uh, I want you to count how many buildings or the distribution of buildings for the county at the first 250 meters outside the flood lane. Well, surprise, surprise, we observed the same exact pattern. But now the students were communicating this. And it was presented as, and these are undergrad students, I'm not giving you a lot of con context, I guess. 
Yeah, but these were undergrad students doing yeah, as part of a of a, a coursework. And they were the ones then communicating, hey, this was one of our findings. You know, we evaluate this, we use these data, this is how we measure it, and we identified that, and it was something like 20 something, I see like 20 something percent of the buildings. And we even went, at, went ahead and count which ones of the government buildings were. And same thing, it was a disproportionate concentration of them. That, I thought it was a very effective way to communicate it. It was more so, hey, here we are engaging, doing research, and through ed education, it was the students, the ones who carried the message. I thought that was very effective. But I'm sure there's other ways sometimes it, Yes, you, you also have a press release coming out and hope and hoping the New York Times picks it up. <laughs> <laughs> On that paper? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was searching for the paper. That's a good that's a good, that's a good. So is it yeah. Yeah. When I think right. Huh. You you are ahead of me, Aaron. When I so generated yeah. this PowerPoint, <laughs> papers in production, and when I generated the PowerPoint, I thought it's gonna be out by then. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of forgot to went back and say accepted or in production. But I was hoping not. I realized that this morning. Yeah. I'm gonna change it again. No one's gonna notice. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'll send. I'll send it. It's right. it hot out of the press. Yeah. But yeah, we also. I also like to engage a lot with um, with with uh, different outlets. As part of that is, I try to engage with local to national. Yeah. Uh, both radio stations, news, newspapers, sometimes television, that's a little bit more awkward. And to try to get the word out into what we're doing, not just the publication, but just make it a bit more accessible. I do work a lot with the university communication department so that we put press releases. I, it also tends to be, I don't know why, why, but every time that we have a flood related manuscript, there is a hurricane. <laughs> that just impacted the nation, sadly enough, but that has happened. So I, I do I do also spend a lot of time talking with reporters, trying to communicate, and that's another way in which I've seen that it's effective for us to take those findings out into the world. But through planning departments, I mentioned we can we collaborate with a number. It's difficult because it then becomes a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? When you publish a paper, it's out there and whomever really cares about this issue, they can go ahead and read it. But when you want to make a change, it's more so on you, I feel, and then you are the one who needs to make that contact and try to find the ways in which you can then connect with yet another community or a planning department. Any other questions? Let's do a drink more. Yes, Raul. Uh, Georgina, thank you for your talk. That was great. Um, so kind of related to the previous question, I guess when using the NLCD data, the developed layer would have a certain accuracy, like it's obviously never 100% accurate. And presumably that's the same with the FEMA maps that you showed us. Um, obviously, when you put two maps together, you would increase the uncertainty even more. So I guess, how do you quantify that? And then maybe even more important than that, how do you communicate that to stakeholders uh, for them to know that, hey, this is never 100% accurate, then we're also talking about a 250 meter zone, which mm -hmm. is compared to the pixel size is not huge, right? So mm -hmm. that's a really good question. Maybe we need to see them for that could be a great project. For a dissertation. <laughs> yeah, short answer, sure. You know, the NLCD data communicates that it's roughly 82, 85% accurate. So that leaves a big area for error, right? Um, we are not right now doing anything to specifically characterize or quantify that. The idea here, just because we're looking at such a large area, to have a sense, a grasp on the problem, rather than specifically say it was 22% versus 27%. That on, on, the, on the aspect in terms of uncertainty regarding the data use. An interesting approach would be use other data sets. Of course, we can always classify our own data, which yeah, would still have error. We can use data, like I already mentioned, the Microsoft building footprint or other type of resources. Yeah, but I doubt we're gonna see a completely different trend. So that on the one side, the second question. I think, a good, I think it's an important research agenda to 
it is a really important. Yeah, I, I'm like, I'm yeah, so we should have signing bonuses for any student or postdoc that wants to quantify and partition futures forecast uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> But back to your other question, you know, certainly with female labs, that is a more challenging question to approach. I don't think we can simply think about it as, as an uncertainty exercise because for regulatory purposes, we don't communicate uncertainty. We are simply telling you, here is the line. It is a hard line. This is not moving. So you're either inside or outside. There is no sense of fussiness in between. There's no sense of error or uncertainty. And typically the way in which the floods, I show you the whole extension, for, for the lower 48 states, but those in reality, those were models that were uh, developed and parameterized across the small catchments. And then we sew those together, we simply combine everything and here's the ultimate uh, product. It is, a, you're asking a really sophisticated question. I don't think I have a sophisticated answer, but, but I, it's a really difficult challenge because I would then pose the question of why even asking this question if when we communicate for regulatory purposes for planning, we're not even telling you there's any type of uncertainty about this. We're simply telling you this is the perfect line. I think, like, oh, sorry. I'm sure Gayla has more. Yeah. To give an example, so Charlotte's one of the few communities we have in the nation that's done a future conditions floodplain mapping exercise. And even then, like when they look at their community floodplain is what they call it, but it's really a future conditions floodplain. So that's kind of accounting for your future uncertainty. It still doesn't change the boundary of the actual 100-year FEMA floodplain. It just adds a new floodplain to their existing FEMA maps that FEMA grants them the ability to do in a very regulatory way. So even when they account for some uncertainty and whether it's right or wrong or establishes kind of uncertain future conditions or not, it still doesn't change the hard hundred year line. It just adds a new line and a new layer of regulation. So it's interesting. Uh, yeah, but that's a really yeah, that's a good question. That's right. Yeah. Because of, uh, we could, sure, we could go ahead and quantify uncertainty for, I'm going to focus on the 100th. 100 year flood plain, we can quantify that uncertainty, but I would argue why. No one, we're not using it. There's no requirement to be integrated into any type of land use planning. And I think this is it's a confronting space between planning and you know the the development arena and the academic arena and that the build up of the scientific knowledge to help inform the other. Yeah, yeah. That, that's where insurance is coming in, though. I mean, insurance companies are going to have slightly different maps. Right. And then if the developer can't sell the property because the people cannot afford to insure the property, I think that's where there's going to be other pressures. I agree with you. Yeah, so that's kind of the question that I'm thinking about. So, like, places that are inside of those high risk flood, flood zones, the FEMA flood zones, are required to have insurance so that's part of why there's so much building just on the edge right because like oh, suddenly i'm outside of the zone i don't have to have insurance so with something like a buffered flood zone if you were talking to someone that's creating like a national policy for updating the national flood insurance could you have like degrees of insurance that are required within this zone or is that something you would think about or you just want everyone to have flood insurance I think that would be a really smart way to approach it with some some scientifically backed, you know, considering not just the horizontal distance, vertical, and a number of factors that at least would allow to give you a sense of fussiness in that line mm -hmm. and not just, or at least, let's say, sure, for regulatory purposes, for planning purposes, we need to have that inside versus outside. But is there a way that we can actively reach out, and this sounds kind of difficult, reach out to every single homeowner, business owner, and tell, and tell us that this is your actual risk. 
So this is the actual probability that in any given year, your property may flood. And I've mentioned this during Ross's class, that is bad marketing, the idea of the 100 year flood plain, because people tend to misunderstand that as this is a flood event that happens once every 100 years, whereas it's not the case. It's a 1% chance any, every, any given year. So is there a way that we can tell them, well, you know, this is your actual probability, at least the sense of low, medium, high, or at least, I mean, and based on your based on your status, here are the recommendations. I think that would the complementary complementing the two. I think would be useful. I don't think it's an easy solution, though. Yes, sir. like a provocative question. <laughs> did the uh, did the insurance industry, in part, create or contribute create this problem, and may they, might they be the disruptor to change it? I, mean, I think when you ask anybody what their insurance premium rates are living like a block off of the coastline or even in the French broad floodplain, it's maybe twice as expensive as a somewhere around here. But you know, you could you could look at the science and it's like maybe an order, many order of magnitude or more higher risk from hazards. So who's paying the cost? All of us. All of us. It's just the insurance industry just like flattened the lens, the, the cost. The, yeah. Yes, that is very tricky. I think originally there was a good intention. Do you want to say something, Laura, sir? No, I said the same thing with health, health insurance. Sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When I was an undergrad, I, a person, uh, a woman from Liberty Mutual came and talked to my classmates and I about this issue, like why did they do that? And like it was kind of being alluded to it. It's like it's basically like living on the coastline is basically a pre-existing condition for like it's like say my family has a chain of like heart disease or something. In the past, I mean I couldn't get health insurance until they like got rid of that. So it's like you you living in a high risk area is is thought of in the housing market the same way as like having a precondition pre-existing condition is for your like medical insurance. It's like, at least that's the way that the insurance industry thinks about it, I guess. So like Ross was saying, they do smooth it out over everybody. Sure. Which is, is it fair? No, but uh -huh. that's kind of the point of insurance is that no one gets screwed too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so just everyone who doesn't live in a high risk area gets But look at New Brunswick County, the fastest growing county per capita in the nation. <laughs> right, who's, so who's winning? Who's losing? Is it, is it, are, are we still have people actively choosing to have a condition? <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah it's that is, saying, yeah, my it. mind is still processing. I feel like there's so many actual <laughs> I'm over something. <laughs> but that's a bit, yeah, it's a bit shocking <laughs> to hear the big one. Yes. Yes. If uh, FEMA would give you a blank check and you can write the sum on it, how would you approach updating their maps? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> and I absolutely have an answer. I would take on an ensemble approach. I think that would be cost effective, the best way to approach this problem, where we bring in multiple, def uh, multiple types of um, models or methods to characterize somehow risk. And then something quite similar to what you know the the, the climate community has done this beautifully, where you have now a, a multiple different models that we can either consider them all through an ensemble approach or consider each one of them to better understand uncertainty. The same, I think, the same type of vision we can adopt. That that's what I think I would do, or at least test to see if it goes anywhere. All right.